you know, I, like I pulled out all my now one books that I had on my shelf in my hand. Now, what did I remember specifically about this one? Or mm -hmm. I kind of had a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. So in your thing, if you want to, you can review a little bit about who he is. You know, if you don't remember, if you guys have done the studies quite a bit. I'm just going to follow. This is the, the study that was online on the Henry Allen site. Mm -hmm. So I thought we would just go through that instead of me trying to make up questions or anything. Yeah, we could have some good discussion that way. Um, I guess I'm, this is the final now one study. And so I kind of reviewed a little bit of my other books and took out a few underlying things that I had underlined in my books quickly. And one of the words was vocation. Mm -hmm. um, and talked a lot about that. And wouldn't you know, I get Webster's Dictionary Word of the Day every day. And on Tuesday this week, one of the Word of the Day was vocation. So I just thought that was good as how, you know, we talk about it. So, you know, I did pull it back up. So I had it on here. I can find it now. So Tuesday, June 7th with vocation, which can refer to simply an occupation. Or it can refer to the strong desire to pursue a particular kind of work or a course of action. So not even necessarily work, but a course of action. So I don't know how, um, I was always told, I used to do a community Bible study uh, when I, we lived in Southwest Iowa. And before we started the study, the question was, what do you hope to gain from this study? So what are, what are your thoughts? Well, I hope to learn an appreciation for now and because I still don't get up. <laughs> yeah. You're kidding me. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I tried his uh, prodigal son and I tried the other one and I just... You know, some books will just grab you and you think, boy, I can identify with this and it moves me. He just leaves me. I finished the chapter and I think, now what did I read? Mm -hmm. That's just me. Your turn. Um, I had passed on the other studies they were happening during the school year and um, it was just hard to find extra time to not only read, but then also give it to reflection. And so I think just to kind of that enrichment. Um, in the conversation and reflection on it. Mm -hmm. It deepened my spiritual life in a devotional way. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I have read Henry Allen on and off for years. And um, although this study was more intense, and I guess to me, his. I mean, here's the famous man who's written all these books, and yet his struggles are like my struggles mm -hmm. in life. I mean, he has the same doubts and the same things. And so <clears throat> I agree, I mean, with Barb, um, throughout the whole study, um, it has strengthened my spiritual life. Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot of things from him. Mm -hmm. The data, the prodigal son, you know, how I'm the father, I'm the prodigal son, and I'm the elder son throughout my life. I've been kind of all of them, and, and I hadn't ever thought about that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm seeking spiritual wisdom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it helps me do that. Yeah. That's me. Center. That's the word I would always come back to in spiritual life is finding the center in Christ. I think, you know, I hope to gain guidance and I um, learn from others as we do talk about what it means to have spiritual life or what it means to have vocation. And I look, think, I still don't, you asked me where I was working. Still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, okay? You know, 50 years old. What do I want to be? I don't know. You know, there. <laughs> but what does vocation look like to me? You know, Darwin, did you want to share anything? You might be messing down the way. I'm good. 
I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that's probably where I. But the other thing uh, I want to talk about just before we get started, I did note uh, busy versus important was one of the things I had. You know, if anybody feels like they want to comment on busy versus important, or when he talked about that, I found myself, and I, I did this a couple different times where I was like, when was this written again? Because that dialogue seems so contemporary. Um, you know, that whole idea of, you know, kind of that condemnation for busyness. And, um, you know, it, I know I always feel a little bit shamed uh, when, when I hear that. And it's very true. Um, we just get caught up and it makes it, it doesn't take long till that nice schedule turns into turmoil almost just because you're not necessarily getting your due attention to much of anything mm -hmm. anymore. But I couldn't believe how long ago he had written this when I was looking at that part and I was like, wow, that could have been written in the last few years. And especially when we experienced with the pandemic, such a shift away from that. Um, I, I think, I don't know if I had ever felt busier than in those couple months right before the pandemic break. We were preparing for a move. Um, both our kids were super busy with their school schedules and we we're, you know, kind of juggling a lot. And then it was just like ripped and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so I, I just thought it was so timely, so relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, the farm culture that I grew up in teaches you busy equals value. Busy equals important. Just the culture I grew up in. Mm -hmm. What is the old saying? Idle hands make. What? Play that one. Something like that. that. Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't hear that a lot or at all, but I just know that. Mm -hmm. the, idea, the idea of idleness is, mm -hmm. leads to no good. Mm -hmm. But farming is kind of an example because you have to be this or you'll have nothing. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, if you don't feed the cows, you right. won't have anything. Exactly. If you don't milk them, you don't have anything. If you don't, if you don't cultivate your corn, you'll have nothing. So you have to be mm -hmm. busy or you'll have nothing. My parents did a great job, though, of setting the example of the Sabbath day and worship. Mm -hmm. I mean, my confirmation pastor, he's developed some dementia now, but he, he would always comment whenever I saw him you know, after he left the church and you know, retired. And, he just thought, what do I say? Your your parents and especially your dad was just always he was the busiest man, he was the hardest working man, but he was always he was always there. I think when we went to having stores being open on Sundays when the switch started to come over, because I like you grew up and my dad was a farmer, my grandparents were farmers. I don't remember a Sunday when all the neighbors were not in church and they were all farmers. They had livestock. They had pigs, they had cows that calved, and they had all those things, but they always were in church. Mm -hmm. Usually wore a suit and tie, too. <laughs> <laughs> but then when they started opening up stores, gas stations started, then pretty soon grocery stores did, then clothing stores did, then your attention got, we got busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you started splitting, splitting your time, so. Mm -hmm. Advertising came in there once you started advertising the seeds were planted. So I'm curious. So in your situation on the farm, then did you not do farm work except the essentials that day? Correct. Sunday was just Sunday. we, we milked cows twice yeah. a day and fed the cattle and whatever else we had to do. We never started a tractor, never went out to plow, never went out to yeah, seed. You only took care of the animals. It was our day off. We just didn't even milk cows. Yeah. We didn't even repair a tractor. I mean, you think that was something you could do, but no, they just. That was Except the women made a great big Sunday. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were not there right. on earth. Right. Clean the table. <laughs> well, that was the essential. That <laughs> <laughs> wasn't one of the essentials. Good <laughs> point. But, but, but it is. But it is. Mm -hmm. But it was. Uh, I mean, they, we didn't do all the. Laundry, all that stuff, but was yeah. the big dinner. And you went to visit the neighbors, maybe, or and or yeah. we always had. Yeah. Usually, you had yeah. somebody yeah. over, or somebody came or driving down the lane. And right. Mom got the cake out that she baked on Saturday, so we could have something to eat. 
in case somebody might come. You just dropped in unexpectedly. Well, that's when my grandparents would stop by on Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. They would have Sunday evening meal maybe with us or fishing. My dad farmed with his brother. And yet they came so all week long. They saw each other, but on Sunday they came over for coffee and cake. <laughs> Sunday by seven days a week. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess what I hear in this conversation is that you can be, you can take care of your business and still carve out time. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you said you feel kind of shame. I, I, I can get that a little bit. I hadn't thought about that, so that's a good insight. But I remember Pearl Larson in my first congregation. She had been a missionary in Africa for 40 years in the Congo, and she she was probably in her late 80s. And Mike came to church one Sunday, and she said, "I haven't seen you around much." And he said, oh, "I've been playing softball on Sunday." And Pearl just, without missing a beat, said, "I think uh, that you can come to worship and still find plenty of time to play softball." <laughs> in a loving way, not to shame him, not yeah. just in a loving way, just to remind him that worship is important. Mm -hmm. Spirit, spiritual life is important. Mm -hmm. And you worry about when you say being busy. You worry about being busy. Is it a productive busy or is it just a nothing busy? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where you get of. back to the idea of important. I'm so busy. I'm important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think right. that was one of his mm -hmm. points, you know, if we're really busy. Mm -hmm. Of course, at my stage of the game, you know, you, what are you doing today? Well, let me think what I did today. <laughs> but I was busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It went fast. It went fast, you know. Our, our daughter, Anne, always checked every morning at 10 because that's her coffee time. <clears throat> she says, what are you doing today? I always have to stop and think <laughs> what, I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to tell her, but um, that it's a it's a different, you know. And then there's the grandkids and the busyness and going here and going there and doing that, or um, still just busy doing stuff. I don't. Know. Well, this can keep busy. It can be both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it can definitely keep you busy. And so, so much has to do with the tone with what you talk about your business. Um, you know, and, and that kind of gets into the idea of fulfillment versus just having your time filled that no one talks about. Um, you know, and we'll laugh sometimes in my family where I, I know with family members, if I say, are you busy on whatever day? You know, it might be months in advance to try and plan something. And I can pretty much predict which family members are going to respond with, oh, I can't possibly know what I'm doing then, or why would you know what you're doing then? You know, like mm -hmm. there's something wrong with you if you actually are looking ahead to Tuesday, November, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so it is kind of that bad honor thing that you brought up of like, um, sometimes we wear it around. Just, and it does have to do with importance. And if you are, are looking at that kind of scheduling, then there must be something wrong with you. You can think about that. <laughs> you know, can, we, can we do away with the other viewer then? Boredom? Well, <laughs> both busy and boredom go together? Or? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You can talk about boredom? I had complacency versus resignation. You know, what prevents us? Uh, from actively searching for the spirit, you know, it's, sometimes I feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start. You know, I've had we've been remodeling, you know, that <laughs> our house, and it's like everything's just dirty, and I don't even know where to start. You know, and you're finally last weekend I got boards up on the top that nobody will probably ever know, but I scrub them and put polish on them and everything, so they're done for another 10 years. <laughs> no, having, I mean, being complacent or not knowing where to start or, you know, so. He talks about filled and unfulfilled. Our lives are hectic and often filled or overpacked, but Henry says we are often unfulfilled. 
what are there some activities we talked a little bit, I guess. I had written down phone and work. Sometimes it's easy to keep working at work right. or to and see what everybody else is doing instead of narrowing down to what I need to do. We really feel like that's an important conversation in our world today, this idea of being filled and unfulfilled. Because I know, I know what it's like to be both, I think. I think when I became a pastor, that really became a fulfillment. I really felt in that vocation, I feel like that's when my life kind of went like this instead of up and down, which no one talks about in other books, you know, but just this idea. Because I can be busy, but I can, I'm fulfilled in that. There are times when I can be overly busy too, just kind of wear myself out. But, but I enjoy what I'm doing. I, I find fulfillment and I find meaning and purpose in it. And so I feel like I can be busy and fulfilled. But I also know that there are many people even in my life who go to work and that work gives them an overflow. You know? mm -hmm. And so they're busy but feel unfulfilled. Like he talks about, like I could just not do this and it wouldn't even matter mm -hmm. to the world. To the people I serve. You know? So I think, I guess I understand both of those, and I just think it's an important concept for each of us to wrestle with. What is it that really fills us? What is it that fills us in our purpose in life? And I think um, the things that I do, I visit, then I call people, and um, I write a lot of notes. And for me, at my stage of the game, that's fulfilling in that I am reaching out to others in my community. And that's where I get my fulfillment a lot of times. Um, and knowing that, and Henry talks a lot about we need to be in community. We need to care for each other. We need to share our stories and we need to uh, give encouragement to each other. And, and, but also there, you know, throughout my life, you know, you think, you know, a lot of unfulfillment there too. But I think when you reach retirement age, you look at things and, it, you know, they always say it's their time to give back, but it's also your time to encourage your kids, encourage your neighbors, encourage your friends, because all our lives are in turmoil sometime or another along the way. I'm trying to ask, do you feel like that's your vocation right now? Mm -hmm. Something like that? I, that, I mean, I think that's an important word to mm -hmm. just this idea of vocation. Because we can have a job. Right. But that calling, the way I understand vocation, but vocatio, I think there's a lot of just this, the calling of life from God. Yeah. Well, you know, I was a librarian for years, yeah. and people would say, so why did you choose? And I, no, I thought a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, in the library, and I was a cataloger, and every book has a certain number on a certain shelf. There is no sway. And I said, when I'm at work, everything is like this. The rest of my life is all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kids are in high school, we're going somewhere every night, and all of that kind of stuff. And then you added Anne into the mixture. And I said, I really enjoyed work because Everything I knew exactly where every book was going to be. And no one was going to change it. <laughs> no one. Dewey said that's where it's going to be. So, anyway. One of the questions here says What are some of your preoccupations and how might they negatively influence your spiritual life? I thought one of my preoccupations can be worry. Mm -hmm. You know, I had the month of May was just crazy for us. We had gra pre graduation, well, we had multiple more than we had 25 or more graduations that we were invited to, three family, close family graduations in three different states. You know, um, well, I guess two are in Nebraska, one is Omaha, and know, it's almost three different states. Um, big family trip to New York City. And, and 
I had to focus on what is next. I couldn't focus so far out. You know, talking about setting your family up. I couldn't, I said, I can't focus that far out. Just we'll make the decisions for July, what we're doing in July, the minimum. But then I had to back up because I was worried about what are we going to do here and there and everything. My mother used to say, Life is what happens when you make another plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, what are some other preoccupations that negatively influence your spiritual life? Or and the last Sunday, we did watch worship online instead of coming, which was kind of like, <sighs> we don't have to, you know, because otherwise we feel like we're going someplace all the time. And that was a, a blessing. On that, yes. I get caught up on Facebook marketplace, you know, in my acreage. I mean, that's one thing I have to work at is balancing because the acreage just sucked me in, and I, I <laughs> right. never come out, you know. Right, but, never ending. Yeah, so it's I have to But it could definitely be a preoccupation. I think sometimes letting regrets mm. come into my mind mm. when you start talking about spiritual life because that's, you know, in, the, in your head. Mm -hmm. um, it can be anything, anything that's way back and little things, big things. And uh, I'm super excited. I'm not going to think like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a Murder or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> if only I had done. If only I had done this or not said that. I would have. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And I have to make myself sometimes. I I was gonna go visit the next owner this Friday. Mm -hmm. Of course, he died on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I was. I boiled a whole bunch of eggs, and then I found out after I had boiled them, you know, Darwin calls and said that Dennis had packed away. So, what am I going to do with the extra hard boiled eggs? I made a bit of hard boiled of boiled eggs, and I'm like, okay, I really don't have time to take them now. Oh, well, go in your ball hat, it's okay. You know, I think sometimes I get stuck in. Has to be perfect to mm -hmm. do something. Sure, the timing. The timing, but I wanted to get him there before lunch, and I'm like, okay, let's go. Yeah, she looked at me twice, Erica did, and then realized who it was because <laughs> she didn't recognize me in my ball hat, my like, my workout clothes on, or whatever. But it was the fact that I still made time, and I I didn't look perfect. It wasn't a perfect thing, but it was a good time. It's probably good timing for her. Yeah, yeah, it was perfect timing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. At least you followed through. Mine is procrastination. I have bought more sympathy cards, more get well cards, more birthday cards. It never got sent. <laughs> yeah. The thought was there, but it never went through the whole process. <laughs> to how much time is needed to do something will be a preoccupation that gets my way. Where I'm like, oh, I should only do that if I have this long of a block of time to dedicate. Do it, and then it does turn into procrastination. So, well, I don't have a three hour block of time to set aside for that, so then I just don't do it another day. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's like that time of the coming. So, you know, mm -hmm. you could put something and, and accept it for imperfections right. or you know, being a work in progress. But I think mm -hmm. sometimes that also then um, interferes with my spiritual life and, and spiritual well being because you're constantly left feeling not good enough. Mm -hmm. That's your measurement. Right. Yeah. Which really ties into Marilyn's other books about this not feeling good worthy. Mm -hmm. and, and the voices we hear in our head. Mm -hmm. I also think, Laurel, when you think about those people and buy a card, it's also a prayer. I know, mm -hmm. but I shouldn't follow. No, but <laughs> don't say you should, but it is. I mean, I often think. You think of people, and and to me, that's often prayers when somebody pops into your mind, or, or you know, like, you're trying to ease my conscience, Joanna. No, you're trying to ease my conscience. No, well, mine do, so thank you. I, I said, mine do, thank you. Well, well, some of this we worry about. We have to write the perfect thing because 
fan noise, right? It's really oh, nice. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? But <laughs> I'm not inspiration piece that says. But I don't have to care myself against Joanne no, right. because no. you have your own gifts. I have my own gifts, and it was the card that I got out, even if I just said thinking of you, that person, you know, it right. doesn't have to be perfect. It's like mm -hmm. Dropping off deviled eggs didn't have to be perfect. <laughs> I definitely didn't look perfect, you know, but, you know, it was at that time. And I think one of the big things that now I keep saying is to forgive ourselves. I mean, he, he has those same thoughts over and over when yes. we read his diaries and all right. that, you know, kind of stuff. Just to forgive ourselves and go on, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know but then aren't you supposed to try to better yourself? I mean, it's like repenting. You don't just say, oh, let's forget about that. Again, again, again. As, as, long as, as long as as long as you don't see that there's this perfect operate that you have to get to. I mean, I think that's what yeah. now I'm going to say is that, yes, we're imperfect. Yes, we're the beloved. We don't yes. have to be a Mother Teresa. Yeah. No. Right. And she yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the story goes where the guy gets to heaven. <laughs> And then Mother Teresa's in front of her and say, Peter says, if only you'd have done more, my Mother Teresa. <laughs> 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 you might be on your yeah. <laughs> Back it up and roll. <laughs> I remember once being told that the fruits of the Spirit will never be fulfilled until my death. I'm like, well, I guess I have a long time to live because there's a lot of fruit that needs to be filled yet. So, like, you know, in today's paper, that one of the girls that was murdered down in Ames was a twin sister. And they were very deeply religious. And two girls prayed together. One of the things they always said, I'll beat you to heaven. Mm -hmm. And here she was, 20 mm -hmm. years old, and her sister said, she beat me to heaven. Mm -hmm. So your fruit to your fair could be short lived. <laughs> you could have a long time for it. Right. I just, it's still growing, so there's lots of time left. So, we're trying to, so you know, we kind of talked about some unfulfilled, it reflects on boredom, resentment, depression, as a result of being unfulfilled. That's what roles these feelings played in your life. He describes uh, boredom, resentment, depression, all of which are signs of discontentedness. Does anybody? Experience or them themselves, or where do you see them in our society? Was it discontentedness or disconnectedness? Disconnectedness. You're right. Disconnected. I, I felt like it was, yeah. yeah. Right. Disconnected. I think it's Andrew Root. He's a professor at Luther Seminary who wrote a book that talks about the, the current generation of. Twenties, thirties. They're 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 the most connected, you know, technologically, mm -hmm. but they're the loneliest generation. Mm -hmm. this, this is pointing now. Again, right. it's so contemporary, right? Yeah. It's like now I could have wrote this book today and it would be mm -hmm. true. Yeah. So we can be connected, but we can just be isolated or kind of lonely. Just walking over here, so I get on a bench. He's laughing. He's looking at his phone. He's just laughing. I thought, dude, you're sitting there by yourself, and you're <laughs> he's just in this own little world, you know. But yeah, are you really connected? Or mm -hmm. just have this picture of connected loneliness, maybe. And I think for men, this is this kind of loneliness. Oh. Right. Busy men. <laughs> and I, I think for me, if I have a day that, you know, so, you know, I mean, how many times can you dust the floors and, you know, do all that? And 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 then I, if I call someone, I think, oh, I'll have somebody over coffee. Or I'll just call someone. It just changes my whole day. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's the connecting to somebody else. And you know, other than Ken, who's around most of the time. Mm -hmm. But um, if there is a day, you know, there's nothing that lifts you up more than talking to someone else or or uh, doing something for someone or, doing, mm -hmm. or pulling weeds out of my garden, out of my flowers, too. A lot of aggression. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<clears throat> you must have a lot of aggression because you don't have any weeds in the garden. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbors say they only see the flowers. So. They're so kind. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. And number nine, our urge to be set free from this isolation becomes so strong that it bursts forth in violence. Can we talk about violet flowers <laughs> our garden? What extent does this observation shed light on violence that can be rampant in our world? I felt very, very moved. I said, and I said it can't be legislated into peace. I mean, it's unfortunately that's true. Would isolation be term more of the, in some respects, that you don't open yourself to read more to get the, the whole picture of why? You know, that, that maybe you thought this one way and you weren't going to move. Because sometimes the church has told you that's the way you have to believe. But you've never looked at the whole picture to see the consequences of that one strictness or what impact that has on those people's lives. I don't know. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely put this in silo either. You know, yeah. that can be. Loneliness, you can't reach out to the next person beside you, you can only look in your and so much of society today has gone that way of thinking. You either think exactly this way in my box, mm -hmm. then I have no time for you, mm -hmm. or I need to get rid of you, or make you think the way I think, or otherwise, we can't exist. Mm -hmm. I know when I read this part about the violence, I couldn't help but think about the shooting you know, that we had. Darwin, I don't know if you'd want to comment on this, but as a as an administrator of a school and just having an awareness of of um, being proactive in preventing any kind of those any of those kind of tragedies, um, I would guess loneliness or disconnectedness of a student might be something you would look for. Yeah, Rod, I, I think if you look at the research on that, and uh, I think it first starts with those kids didn't have any adult connection in the school okay. uh, would be your first indication. And so, you know, that's one of the things you always look for and, and reach out. And we monitor that in many ways. You know, one is an example of, you know, if any kid's sitting by himself at the lunch table. Mm -hmm. uh, there better be a specific reason for a kid sitting by themselves. And sometimes a kid just needs to to be away from peers, but we, we monitor that. And uh, I think we have a handle on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, children are our greatest resource and, and that I think that's where I feel my service, but, uh, you know, those tragedies just continue to bring things to light, but we focus on relationships. We do have a lot of protocols in place. Um, I hope we never have to use them. I hope, we're, I hope it's the worst money and time we've ever spent as a district. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Sue. And I, I have <clears throat> volunteered for years to be a reading buddy mm -hmm. for, like, in the junior high. <clears throat> when we have 20 minutes to read. And the first few minutes is, how was your week? You know, what's going on? Oh, oh, oh. And then we read for 15 minutes and then we talk about what's going on. <clears throat> and I'm always amazed at the end of the year, they jump sometimes two grade levels in reading. Mm -hmm. And I say, I'm only with 15 minutes a week, really. I mean, to help them with their reading. And they said, you care. You ask about them. You ask about what's going on, mm -hmm. and you show them mm -hmm. that because you show up, it's, it's they're important. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought about that. I thought I was going just to help them be mm -hmm. better readers, and some do become better readers, but they also, you know, it's it's hard to explain what fifteen minutes mm -hmm. talking to a youngster can do, for them, you know. And how important it is for each student to, at some point in the day, having gone home, hearing somebody say their name mm -hmm. and being individually acknowledged and affirmed. You know, what a different, I don't need to talk about that a lot in my previous education. Yeah, teaching. Mm -hmm. To say, 
that was really good reading. You sounded out that word. I mean, there's little things like that, you know. It's, you know, it's that's gratifying to mm -hmm. do that. So. It sounds like you give meaning to their reading in a sense. I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, that is what now when it's talking about, we can go through the motions without meaning and still be empty. But when an adult is with me for 15 minutes and tells me how I'm growing and how, you know, encourages me, I mean, you're, you're giving meaning to that reading. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Depends on the student, I suppose. That was the last one before it goes to the conclusion of this section. That's how I was going to get three sessions out of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I got four here. I got four here, I know. But we're only you know, pretty through two of them. So. <laughs> um, Jesus responds to the condition of being filled yet unfulfilled. What is What do the scriptures say? Did anybody go through the scriptures and... <clears throat> Think about that. Scripture says, filled with wrong things, those not of the spirit. This must be on the study guide. Yes. Has the study guide been posted online? No, I have it and so, I can't. Yeah, so let's get that to Zach okay. next week if you wouldn't have yes. posted online. Yeah, so I didn't have those. But, yeah. That's okay. I had some. And of course, I have the benefit of their. Well, if you don't use it, I like my Bible. I can find it on here. Bible Gateway. <laughs> you can search for specific words. Yeah. And so I pulled out that. And I pulled out busy and worry as both of them. So I have 1 Timothy 5. I can, I can pull it back up. First. Yeah, yeah, I know. So while Cindy's looking for that, just know if you're watching this later online uh, through the recorded version that we'll get the study guide up on uh, on emmanuelfamily.com so that you can uh, find that as well. Uh, first, Timothy, first Timothy 5. So besides they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house, and they do not only become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. Ooh. That's kind of a <laughs> becoming a busybody, or you know, I think it's easy to. Are you going to go there because you care about that person and want to share with them, and, and you, or are you going there just to find out what the latest gossip is? <laughs> You'll have something to bring back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. That one almost supports the idea that idleness is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas now one would say idleness isn't a bad thing when you're dis disconnecting from your busyness in order to connect with God. Right. Yeah. And then First Kings 20, verse 40 talks about busyness also. Are we doing worry or business? This is busy. Okay. While your servant was busy here and there, the man disappeared. That is your sentence, the king of Israel said. You have pronounced it yourself. Not paying attention, maybe, but you know. Uh, this morning I was watching about the number of people that have drowned, you know, because they weren't, their parents weren't paying attention to, you know, a child or whatever, because they're busy doing something else. I, that kind of, you know, what is slipping away from us? Because we're too busy. Those things that are important, those things. How long can you have my attention, Sam? Mm -hmm. Before it wanders. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do with the sermon. Less than a goldfish is what Bruce Melky does. A human's attention span is less than a goldfish. <laughs> That's what Ken always says when he talks speech. He said, I know there's a number of you who aren't even listening right now. Mm. I'm going to do this, and he does it, and they have jump. <laughs> you know, yeah, because their attention spans, yeah. and he says it happens to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. 
kind of like in the sermon where you might say something about and then and then they got something or like some food and you think, oh that's right, I need to put that down on my worship <laughs> list. <laughs> Remember, I like that. And pretty soon the sermon's gone and you're just making your grocery list. <laughs> I always say the spirit Never can work in all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Can't worry. Uh, what would be the worst thing is you'd start up, okay, now, Twain, tell me what my sermon was about today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then the worry, you know, I think this is uh, pretty daunting. I mean, I worry, you know, what my future, my, my kids are going to be doing, all that stuff. But Matthew 6, 25 and following. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. How many times do we worry about what we're going to wear someplace or whatever? With life not more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or soar away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you are not much more. And are you not much more valuable than they? Into that one, someone had written, yes, he does, but he doesn't throw it in the nest. <laughs> <laughs> Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard. It is hard. You know, I think, oh, I'm planting my garden. Thank goodness I don't have to live off of my garden because I or sustain myself off my garden, but could I or? I, mean, I think the biggest one would be, of course, everyone, but as a farmer, it's a constant worry because your whole income is based on something you have no control, mostly have no control over, weather. Well, just this week, my brother lost 500 acres of corn mm -hmm. because they had hail, so if they had to not off the roads. Yeah. Yeah. It's something you, you know. have no control over, and so it just, but yet it could affect you. You've got a family to feed. We've got bills to come in, and you could be one year can just be nothing, and the next year could be good. It's hard not to worry, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, I think it's important in that scripture to remember that Jesus doesn't, he doesn't really say explicitly, don't worry. What he says is, don't worry about tomorrow. Because yeah. we don't have any control of tomorrow. We just don't. As much as we want to make ourselves think we do, we just don't. Because today's the day has enough worries. So he doesn't say, you know, what is it, Akuna Matata? Don't worry about yeah. tomorrow. Right. Don't worry about tomorrow. And, and we pray that, give us today, or yeah, I think literally that is give us today our bread for tomorrow. If we were to pray the Lord's Prayer, literally, give us today our bread for tomorrow. So he's always encouraging us to give tomorrow's worries to God. God has at least some sway over to me. Our grandson who just graduated is really into cars, fixing cars, loud cars, loud music, going to car shows. Uh, and, and I just, and they live in the Twin Cities in St. Paul, and I just, he likes to drive fast, and it's a constant yes. <laughs> for yes. me. It's hard to just say, God, whatever will be, will be. But I don't want anything to happen to him. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think, you know, I talked to our son, and he said, you know, Mom, it's kind of a phase. He went through a computer phase, and now he's into this phase. And he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And it's hard, I think. You know, to not know, but <clears throat> but uh, we were up there, and and he and his friends came, and the <laughs> neighbor came across the street and said, complained about all the noise. It's hard so, not to worry. It's hard not to worry. It's hard not to worry about young people today, or you know, I just think and so. I, I have to really work on giving that word out mm -hmm. and let, you know, that kind of... And yet I say, be who you are. You know, we all have to be sure. who we are, uh, you know, no matter what. Most of my life, most of my life, I did what people thought I should do. Mm. 
and um, and I'm going to have to get this old to think I can be whoever I want. I can be this lady who goes out and waters her plants in her bedroom slippers. You know, <laughs> but it takes a long time. It took a long time to do that. Right? And so I say to all my grandkids, be what you want to be. In the back of my mind, I'm like, but do this. Yeah. <laughs> My guess, my guess is too, as you worry about a grandfather, that, that you also let that worry lead to prayer. Yes. You know, yeah. I, oh, know, yeah. I know you well enough yeah. to know that. Well, I always pray, give me patience right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I had underlined in the, on page 21, which is the very first page of the introduction, we talked about living uh, in like a silo or not. Not reaching out to others. It says the spiritual life can only be real when it is lived in the midst of pains and joys of the here and now. So it doesn't mean your spiritual life is before or after our existence. You know, talks about that. Oh, it'll be, I'm working towards that spiritual life that can be lived out here. Or that was, you know, raising children was, you know, spiritual life. And now I can be here. And daily and how we spend our time what we worry about which we're going to worry but we have scripture to fall back on and i was glad that the, the study referred back to some scripture but it just every now and then a very very good writer and i appreciate what he talks about because it makes me very contemplative about what i'm doing or reading or thinking you know kind of focus my attention, but we always have the scripture to fall back on and God's promises. So, are there other thoughts about how we are filled or unfilled today? Um, always. Can you read that last quote again? Yeah. It <clears throat> Page 21. <laughs> The whole thing, the, the spiritual life can only be real when it is lived in the midst of pains and joys of the here and now. So that, that quote reminds me of a movie, a uh, quote from the movie, Into the Wild. It's about a kid who went into Alaska and lived by himself and struggled to survive. At the very end of the movie, it says something like, he's journaling and it was like the last entry of his journal. So something like happiness or life can only be shared. I just, I look for it here online, but I can't find it. It reminds me of this. So the spiritual life, say that again, the spiritual life. The spiritual life can only be real when it is lived in the midst of the pains and joys of the here and now. So the previous sense that this is the very first sentence of the paragraph. The spiritual life is not a life before or after or beyond our everyday existence. It's it also reminds me of Bonhoeffer in, in one of his books about community. He talks about if you try to find the perfect community, kind of the utopian community, you end up destroying the very blessing of the community you're already in. You're always looking for that next thing. And I think the spiritual life is it's kind of like somebody said that it feels like sometimes we have to get life ordered and have the time and everything prepared and then we'll move into our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and spiritual life happens in the midst of the messiness, you know, in the midst of busyness and the word. Because mm -hmm. if we wait till well, we don't have the worries and the, the stress and the pain and the busyness. Well, then we're never going to get there, mm -hmm. right? And just, we have again. That's that place of being centered, centered in Christ. She talked about in in lifting the cup, you know, to mm -hmm. take your cup of life and mm -hmm. look at it, and all of all of your disappointments and things mm -hmm. in it. And then out of that comes joy, and then you lift it up to God. Mm -hmm. You know, 
in that way. So, you know, we will never be pain free. Yes. You know, my mom, because my mom always used to say, well, next year it's sure going to be better. It's going to be somebody else in crisis. Yes. <laughs> right. But that's the way it is. You know, and we have to kind of, you know that. You know mm -hmm. that. But it makes me think too of how important it is to every once in a while slow down and take inventory. Like, what am I feeling right now? And and letting that pain and joy be there, whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be, and in whatever doses it's in. Um, but kind of taking stock of that because that's living. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't just going through the schedule and pick another day going. Right. Um, that isn't fulfilling at all. Being mindful, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done some mindfulness practices or whatever, and it's like, okay, now what are you hearing? What are you feeling? How are you feeling? How does, you know, every part? And accepting that. And it's like, okay, that's who I am today and how I feel, and, you know, being thankful in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Does that help with Henry now and Laurel? I'm still not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> we got two more sessions, Laurel. That's a good thing. That's okay. If you're here, if you're here. I'm trying. He still isn't gripping me, but you may not connect with Henry no. now, but you're connecting with us. Yeah. 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 Us. How long has he been gone? More than ten years. Very long. Yeah. Oh, this is his. This is the twenty fifth year. 25th. I guess. What's the anniversary here? Yeah. What's the anniversary? Okay. Priest in the, in the United States or? Um, well, he was originally from Poland. Then he came to the United States and part of Yale and Harvard. Then went mm -hmm. to a large community in Canada and lived with, lived with folks with disabilities. He died in 96. Oh, yeah. Oh, in front okay. of your cup. I think I remember he lived in Canada because isn't that in the cup? Yeah, where he worked with the disease. So you want to mention pre wrap wrap. You want to mention next time then next week we'll cover section two section chapter two. two. Yeah. And close Kingdom with first. Prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to meet and to enjoy one another's company to discuss your will for our lives, your vocation for our lives, and. How we navigate the day day to day. Bless our time this week as we prepare for next week. May it strengthen our, our relationship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks for joining us online, so, Darwin. Sure, yes. You're making things new. Hopefully, Thanks, Rod. <laughs> he says devotional and